Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here at The Strand. For a, before we launch into a discussion of Alexei Lubomirsky's poetry collection, Talk to Me Always, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until, after over 93 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third-generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today, and we are so very appreciative of it. Tonight, we are thrilled to have with us best-selling author Alexei Lubomirsky to launch his poetry collection, Talk to Me Always. Alexei is a world-renowned fashion and portrait photographer who shoots celebrity cover stories for magazines such as Vogue, Elle, and Harper's Bazaar across the globe. Among other things, Alexei shot the official engagement and wedding portraits for Prince Harry and Miss Meghan Markle. In 2014, he published Princely Advice for a Happy Life, a book written for his two young sons on the virtues of behaving in a manner befitting a prince in the 21st century. In 2019, he published a children's book, Thank You for My Dreams, Bedtime Prayers of Gratitude. Aiming to create an occasion for children and adults to express, enjoy, and connect through their gratitude. Alexei is also a global ambassador for the humanitarian charity Concern Worldwide, to which he donates all of his book's proceeds. He lives in New York with his wife and their two sons. Joining Alexei in conversation is Mickey Boardman. Mickey is the editorial director of Paper Magazine, where he's worked for 28 years. He writes a body positivity column called Fat and All That, and is a regular commentator on fashion, pop culture, and world history on networks like CNN, VH1, E!, and more. He has been a vegetarian for over 30 years and cruelty-free for 20 years. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Alexi and Mickey to the stage. Hello, hello. Hi. How are you? I'm okay, how are you? No, you're not. You're fabulous. Okay. <laughs> Let's start off with a fabulous. Perfect. <clears throat> start yeah. as you move on. Is this going to be the first time you've read your poetry in front of a, a group, even although virtual? This is definitely the first time. And I, I mentioned to you that the other day, I've been having dreams for the last week about me, me being naked in public, <laughs> which I think is, this is a perfect representational metaphor of what we're about to do now. Perfect. That's funny because I've been having dreams about you naked too, but that's a separate <laughs> That's for our grinder chat, not for our exactly chat. wrong <laughs> platform. <laughs> but um, so congratulations on the book; it's fabulous. And I, I thought it's interesting. You were saying how poetry is like therapy for you. So how did you discover that? Like, did you all of a sudden one day just think to yourself, "Hmm, I'm, why don't I just write down this thing that I'm thinking about in my head?" Yeah, I think it was, I remember starting to write when I was about, I started to write a journal when I was about 15 or 14. And because you're going through all those teenage angst problems and, you know, nobody to talk to and nobody understands you. And I think in my sort of 30s, I was still writing a journal the whole way through. And then in my 30s, these journal entries started to become poem because I think I was able to sort of translate an emotion rather than saying, I feel like this, I feel like this. I realized I could translate that in, in emotion into more of a, a flowing narrative or something. And it just came out differently. I don't know, it wasn't a conscious choice. It just sort of started to evolve into that. Mm -hmm. And what inspires you when, you, when you're going to your journal? Do you go to work through issues or to document happy times or both? It's, or? Honestly, it's, it's one of those things, I've talked to so many people about how they write, whether it's organic or whether they can just sit down and force themselves to write. And I'm definitely one of those people who has to be organic. And, but it can be, I can go weeks without writing anything and nothing will touch me. And then all of a sudden something will happen and three will come out. And it's just, I remember I was taking pictures of Bruce Springsteen once and he was one person I wanted to ask about his writing process. And after we got to shoot, I had like two minutes with him. I said, listen, when you write, is it organic or can you force yourself? And he said, um, you know, when you, uh, I'm going to try and do his voice. <laughs> 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 uh, 
I'm sorry to all the Bruce fans. He goes, you know, sometimes, sometimes uh, you just hit something like you hit a vein, and you got to just keep pumping it out. And that's exactly what it is. It's just like it's like this this tap little drop opens, and you just got to keep keep going and keep writing it down as it as it comes out. Because I've tried it in the past to I felt something in the past, and I thought I've written a note to myself saying, "Remember to write a poem about this." And when I come back to it, it's gone. You might just you might have the idea there, but all the emotion that was there surrounding and, and coloring all the, the sections in has disappeared. So it's really about writing it down as and when it comes in. And um, I think I've written one poem forced before, and the poem was about <laughs> not being able to write a poem. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So one of it seems like a, one of the recurring themes in your poetry is love. Have you always been? Remind me what sign of the zodiac you are. I'm a Virgo. I'm a, okay. I'm a Libra. Um, do you and have you always been very sentimental about love, or do you consider yourself sentimental about love? I'm definitely a cheesy romantic. I mean, no, no doubt about it. I, I've tried to hide from it before, and it's just me. And. Uh, I remember I, I did write poetry before, and I remember when I met my wife, I very nervously, I think it was about maybe a month or two months into dating, I wrote a poem for her, and I was so scared to give it to her because it could either be like, get out of here or whatever. And she read the first two lines and started crying. <laughs> and in my head, I was like, oh, I'm gonna marry this girl. <laughs> She's the one. So um, <laughs> if you have to pick up it for the, the, for the poetry. Did that poem make it into the book? Is that one of the ones she let you put in, or? Oh no 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 no! That was uh, no new. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, I, but as, yes, you're right. She she did. I, she let me. Uh, she allowed me three poems to to be put into this book. The ones I've written for her. Um, when we when we got married, I I remember thinking because I, I overanalyze everything, and I remember thinking to myself. Okay, I'm a married man now. And I remember, you know what it was? It was somebody who came up to me, or people came up to me saying, oh, Alexi, you got married. You're probably gonna be unfaithful because you're, you're a fashion photographer, you'll be unfaithful. And I thought, this sucks. Why, you know, why does it have to be a sort of written in stone thing? So I remember just immediately going down all these avenues, talking to all these people about how do you keep a marriage going? And one of the many things was, you know, just try, keep doing the dramatic things. And so I made a sort of uh, um, uh, this, idea that I was going to write her a poem every month from when we got married. So, and then obviously special occasions and da, 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 da. So I've written about 230 poems for her in our 10 year or 12 years together, 10 years of marriage. And so she let me have three. <laughs> so, yeah. She wants to do a book of all of them eventually for herself. Probably. I have asked her if she would ever let me. She said that, she said, for the moment, they're ours. And then maybe in 20 years, she'll let me publish them. So. Tell her the money can go to the oceans instead of to Concern Worldwide. Yeah, no. see, you know how to get them. See. <laughs> speaking, think... of, speaking of Concern Worldwide, how did you tell us a little bit about the charity that all, no. because you're so generous, all the money from this, this book goes, and many of the things that you do, the money goes to Concern Worldwide. So, what is, tell us about the charity and how you got involved in it. So, Concern Worldwide, amazing humanitarian charity. They're eradicating poverty in 23 of the world's poorest countries. They also have emergency programs with like Ebola and earthquakes and floods and famine and refugees, and they're everywhere all the time. And I remember when I was, I got my first paycheck as a photographer, it must be about 2003. And I'd always wanted to give money to charity, but you know, the jobs I had, I never had any extra. And so for this first time, I got this big check and I thought, right, I've paid the rent, I've bought food and whatever else I needed. And so I went out into the streets and thought, today I'm going to need money to charity. And that first person who shook a can at me on the street was this concern worldwide. And so I put up a monthly donation. And then when I wrote my book, Princely Advice for a Happy Life, I got in touch with them and I said, listen, would you mind if I sort of attach my book to your, your cause? And I don't think they kind of knew, they didn't know anything about me because I was nobody. And um, they said, yeah, sure. And then the book got translated into six languages and got loads of press. And all one day they emailed me and was like, who are you? <laughs> Can you come in and see us? And so I went to see them and then I became an ambassador for their cause. And um, yeah, they're amazing. God, that was a lucky can shaker on the street that shook it in front of you. <laughs> yeah. I often wonder why they're, because so many charities do that kind of thing on the street. And I always feel like hesitant to give and that 
case I like to think about it and sort of donate online or something like that. But now I know why, because sometimes they can land a big fish like you. You never know. <laughs> I love it. But um, something else you write about, a poem that you wrote about and you, that you talk about that's very dear to you is your being a vegan. How long have you been a vegan and um, how has it changed your life and why are you vegan? Uh, my, I became vegan. My wife went to a food institute called the Anne Wigmore Institute and she came back, learned all this stuff about food, and she said, baby, we have to change our eating habits. And so it was definitely, it was for health. You know, it was one of those things, the word vegan was so foreign to me, and I alien. I thought, I never, I might become vegetarian, but never vegan. It was too far out there. And, but, you know, you give me a project, and I'll go hell for leather in that direction, because I'm a stupid Virgo. And, um, and I went uh, vegan, and I think it was so interesting, because after about a month, two months, I remember sitting in a restaurant, and I was with some friends and they had a steak and some bacon and I had my vegetables and I suddenly looked over and he was cutting into the meat and I saw this, I saw it was like, wow, that's flesh. That's really interesting. That's flesh. And the cow flesh they call steak and my spinach is called spinach and the pig meat is called uh, bacon, but my uh, broccoli is called broccoli. And then the whole curtain comes down and you suddenly realize everything that you've been taught and it's nobody's fault, it's just society. But then you start seeing things and I realize that, uh, I, I, I always tell people there are four doorways into veganism. You can either do it for the animals, for the environment, for your health, or for some sort of spiritual evolution uh, and or spiritual growth. And But the wonderful thing is, it doesn't matter which doorway you take in, because once you're inside there, you reap all the rewards and you sow all the rewards. So if you go for health, you still save the planet, save the animals, and whether you like it or not, you become a bit more compassionate and therefore evolve spiritually, so. Mm -hmm. And so you've also started an organization that gets people to commit to not shooting fur, leather, and feathers. Yes, yeah, that was a, that was a one that I wanted to get off the, off the ground. But I didn't really think I had the power to do it, and after I'd shot the royal wedding and the engagement, my name was you know, a lot more visible, and, uh, or my visibility increased. So I was able to get into more doors, and uh, I would get in touch with people in the industry and I would let them know that I wanted to get in touch about a, um, meet them about a project that I was doing. I didn't tell them what it was, which is kind of sneaky and cheeky. And so when they, they were like, okay, great. Yeah, it could be cool. It's an exhibition or a book. And I sat them down in the restaurant and I said, so listen, how would you feel about not shooting fur feathers or exotic skins anymore? And you can see some of them were like, amazing, fantastic. And other people would just be looking at me going, you could see the eyes going, oh shit, how do I get out of this one? <laughs> but um, it was amazing because most people, the thing is we all know that it's, it's 2020 and it's time that we stop using this stuff. And there are other options out there. And so um, people are changing. So I just wanted to use my visibility while I have it. You know, the fashion world is a very fickle business. And one day you're in, one day you're out. And I want to make sure that while I'm in, I use every ounce of influence I have before I get kicked out. Well, you certainly have. And, you know, you know, that's interesting because I, one of the things I wrote down was fashion is so shallow. And I listen, I am a fashion person completely. But you are such an unshallow person. You're so, you have so many depths. Do you feel a little bit out of place in fashion? Or do you feel like maybe this is where we need to be because you'll, you're bringing depth to this world? Or is, is maybe fashion not really shallow? I think, I think the fashion world is a wide river. And I think you can choose where you want to swim. And I think it's just about inviting all the people on the other areas to come and swim in your lane. Um, and it's not because anybody is wrong or they, they're bad people. It's just that, you know, we, we've been brought up in a certain way to believe certain things are luxury. And, you know, you have to start breaking it down. And 2020 has been a very interesting year in the sense that we've all been forced to pause. Every brand has been forced to stop and go, OK, hang on. What is the public actually interested in? you know, ethical choices and more compassionate choices. And so I think it's just the way forward. And, you know, fashion world is, is or fashion industry is all about looking forward, what's coming around the corner. Okay. And now you already mentioned it, but, you know, I have to ask you about the, your being the official photographer for the royal engagement of the Sussex wedding and also being at the wedding. What was that like? Uh, crazy, amazing, wonderful, surreal. Um, the, the engagement was a wonderful day because it was simply just a couple and us and beautiful November, low misty light in Windsor Castle and everything was wonderful. And the wedding was just a crazy day because we had 25 minutes to shoot all of these 
official portraits of the queen and of the, the, the whole family and then the couple and the bridesmaids. And it was insanity. And um, well, I remember sitting in the, in the chapel while the wedding was going on. And on one, hand, one side of your brain is going, this is so cool, you're at a royal wedding. And it's like, and then you sort of look above all the hats and you see all these um, movie lights and cameras and you realize the whole world is watching. And uh, it was quite funny when we walked into the chapel, one of the notes that you're given or the sort of verbal notes were given by one of the, um, the guards is uh, they say, the world is watching you, so please, and they, the world is watching you and they can lip read, so please watch what you say. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody's talking like this. <laughs> uh -oh, I love it. Were there any, during the official portraits, were there any personalities that jumped out at you as being surprisingly charming or fun or that, you know? It, you know, it was so rushed. It was, and the only way I can describe it is like any typical family portrait on a special occasion. It's like what I could, what I imagine it to be like when you have a big family at Christmas or Thanksgiving and you're trying to get everybody in. You know, the uncles and aunts are screaming at the kids and like, go to bed now and do this. And, and it's just, it's just wrangling. Um, but it was, it happened so quickly. And it literally, I didn't, I didn't have one second to even look at the screen to see what the pictures were doing, what, what the pictures would look like. So when my assistant finally gave me the hard drive and I was driving home <clears throat> to my mother's, I remember flicking through the images going, please let there be one. And then when you see the image, and like I said, I'm a cheese ball, I love love. And when you Ooh. see the image of the couple sitting on the step and they're hugging and they're looking at each other and it's like, oh, it's just amazing. <laughs> I love it. So speaking of love, before you read like your poems and stuff about love, how did you meet your wife? Were you set up on a blind date or walk us through that? Um, consumption. Walk you through. Um, it was a cold and misty evening, and no, it was, um, she was uh, the um, curator of Milk Gallery uh, in Milk Studios, and I was a photographer at Milk Studios, and I used to see her around and about the place. And I remember um, it was December the seventeenth, two thousand seven, at uh, Thomas Hayo's Christmas party. Did you ever go to one of those parties? No, I know Thomas, but I have not been to one of his Christmas parties. And I remember it was about three o'clock in the morning and I was heading towards the coat rack and then there was an arm coming in next to me and it was her. I said, oh, you're that girl from Milk and blah, blah, blah. And we sat down on this chaise long in the middle of the dance floor and we were chatting away and I was, I had enough wine in me to be a bit cheeky and sort of say, I'm going to give you a kiss. And I remember kissing her and we were kissing, but there's still all these people coming around us. So I thought that like a baby ostrich, if I cover my head, nobody will be able to see us. <laughs> so I covered, I covered us with, a, with a, the nearest jacket. And so somebody walked past, I think it was Thomas Hayo, and saw these four legs coming out of this uh, jacket. And um, he took a picture. And six months later, when we were dating, he sent us this picture. So we have a picture of our first kiss, not that you can see our faces, but. <laughs> wow. So that was it. And then, uh, a year and a half later, we were married. So. Fabulous. And what sign of the zodiac is she? She's a Gemini. Okay. A Gemini in a Virgo. I'll have to do some research on that one. <laughs> are there now, are there any topics for poems that you have not explored that you would like to in the future? Uh, you know, uh, very good. Kind of I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's because it's all organic. It really just comes to me. There's so many, there's, things that just come to me that I would never even dreamt of writing a poetry about. I remember watching this, I remember watching this um, movie with Julianne Moore. I can't remember what it's called, but it's the one where she, it's a couple of years ago where she's starts to have um, dementia or, or Alzheimer's or something. Still Alice or something I think it's called. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I think that's one. And um, I, it affected me so much. And I think I, we both came out of there just bawling our eyes out. And I immediately had to write a poem about it because, and it was a poem about being as if I had Alzheimer's and Jada was, and we were much older and sort of remembering this woman in front of me and just remembering that smile and remembering a little sparkle in her eyes and that's fine, so. Wow, have you told Julianne that story? No. <laughs> maybe, she's in the, maybe she's in the chat, she could type in a question. Because we are gonna have questions from the audience later, so please, if you have questions, I guess you should type them in the, into the um, chat. Um, so do you feel like, are you ready to maybe read some poems now or, or how do you feel? Not really, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> All right. 
Let me shake my way through it. Um, all right, so uh, we've got seven poems here, and I'm gonna start off with one, as Mickey said, um, about Ramwitz, because uh, because Jada is, my wife Jada is uh, the, the biggest inspiration and influence in my creative life. And uh, so, as I said, she let me have two or three poems for this book. So I'm gonna share a PDF, because every poem has a photo that goes with it in the book. So I'll just uh, put this here. So this one is called A Kiss. <clears throat> Every day we share a kiss, a good morning kiss, a hello kiss, and I love you kiss. Kids run around, meals get made. We rush from daily routine to daily routine. A kiss here, a kiss there. I love you, I love you too. A week passes, two weeks pass. I love you, kiss, kiss. We work, we laugh, we sleep. Stop. When is a kiss a kiss? For once, let us stay still for longer than the time it takes to touch lips and smile. We need to stop and look at each other. We need to lock eyes for more than a fleeting glance between kids and life. Lean forward, share one breath. Nose to nose, we are close enough to see into each other. I remember you before all of this happened. You are her. You are that girl who woke my heart from a deep slumber. You are the girl I kissed at a party. You are the one who roused my capacity to love, the soul that called mine into the open, the beauty that inspired and inspires me still, the mother of our beautiful boys. Now lean further still. I gently touch your full lips. Again, I move closer. Lips part, tongues lightly caress. I feel that fizz that I felt the first time. This is my girl. The girl whose real kiss makes me feel love. The spirit who my heart belongs to. Again and again we kiss and my top lip feels right and fizzes once more. Still touching, we smile at each other. How I love those smiling eyes. The world around us that for a moment had paused starts to speed up again. Mummy, daddy, can I have a... We dive back into the daily river of duty, love remembered and renewed. As we get pulled in opposite directions, I look over at you. I love you, I say. I know. So that's uh, that poem. Um, the second poem is, uh, is uh, inspired by my stepfather. My stepfather was a guy called John Mainwaring and he raised me since I was about one and a half years old. And in terms of step parents, he was the absolute golden jackpot. Um, I couldn't have asked for somebody who was more loving and supportive and everything. And um, about nine years ago, uh, he went to the doctor and the doctor said that he had uh, two weeks to, uh, three weeks to live. And um, we all went home. And during those three weeks, we, I spoke to him every day about life, about death, about love, about, because it's very interesting talking to somebody who is at the end of their life. They, they could, they're able to look at their whole life in its entirety and sort of take stock of everything. And we talked about what is the purpose? What, what, are, we, what are we here for? Um, and this is based on from what he said. It's called purpose. We enter this life with no possessions, a simple and yet complex soul. We have nothing and we know nothing, free from the shackles of our imminent lives. Eventually we will move on to the next plane and again we will leave with nothing. Try as we might, we are unable to carry any of our attained earthly riches. All that we toiled for, all that we acquired will be for naught our souls refusing to be weighed down by these false gods. So the question remains, how can we leave this life richer than when we arrived? How do we enrich and therefore evolve our souls? The answer floats in front of me, easier to pluck from the air than a low hanging fruit begging to be eaten. Love, that one simple word, that cliche, that bumper sticker, that word thrown around like confetti, yet it is the answer, love. To add infinite and immortal riches to our soul and achieve some semblance of spiritual evolution, all of our attempts have one 
simple core ingredient, love. The love that lies within charity, the love that begins with chivalry, the love that makes us stand up for others, no matter their skin color or beliefs. Then there is love for all, love for all the birds and beasts that crawl, fly and swim from the mighty whale to the tiny bee. Love for the life-giving forces of our world, the jungles and oceans, deserts and mountains. The powerful love that resonates when we choose to protect the planet, which in turn protects us. And then there is love of self. By understanding that I am joined to the passerby, the bee, the jungle, this planet and the energy that contains us all, I begin to understand that I am everything. So I sit in silence and I choose to love myself. In doing so, my love for I and everything echoes in the people I meet, the actions I take, the past, the present and the future. So I decide to be rich, richer than I can ever dream of. Yet this will not be measured in coin, mortar or land. It will be counted in the lives that I touch, the animals and environment I protect. Love will be my mighty bow from which my life's purpose will be released. I vow to love and therefore evolve. This will be my inheritance. <clears throat> uh, the next one is, there's a few about uh, poems about nature and the environment. And um, this is uh, written about a memory I had when I was um, uh, traveling by myself uh, when I was about 19 and I went to Peru, my mother's Peruvian, so I went to check out my roots. And I was swimming at a beach where they were holding some sort of world surf championships at the other end of the beach. And so just where the uh, competition stopped, I would swim there. And I'd never been in such mammoth waves before. And it was one of the most scary things I've ever done um, because you would literally feel like you're being thrown around by this giant. So this um, is about the memory of that. And it's called Wave Fighter. I wade arrogantly into the spray like an overconfident fighter, puffing out my chest as if to goad this unknown opponent. As soon as the bell rings, a haymaker lands on my jaw and salted naivety drains from my, from my nose. I get straight up and smirk it off. Sucker punch, I mutter as I shake off the foam. Ignoring cautious instincts, I sidestep one punch and jab through another. I turn again and am immediately pummeled with an uppercut. Momentarily stunned, I have no time to rebound. A right, then a left. I lower my head to face him head on. I swing blindly while trying to, spit, to wipe his spit from my eyes. Either he is growing with each punch or pound for pound, I am out of my depth. Yet there is fight left in this brawler yet. I weave, I dodge and glance up beyond my sodden fists. Doubled in size, he suddenly towers over me, and I see certain annihilation about to descend. Instinct takes over, and I dive, kicking furiously to escape the avalanche. Under him, I feel the weight of his punch as it crashes like a demolished building onto my feet before they slip through to freedom. I propel myself up and gratefully gasp for air, but he is not done, not by a long shot. The first being a decoy, he thunders all of his fury down, and I am out, gone, decimated. Round, down, and twisted I go like a limp and torn ragdoll, not knowing my up from my down, left from my right. I try to find air, but he pulls my legs down, determined to drown all arrogance from my lungs. I feel the ground for a split second and push off. Finding air, I breathe in with a wild roar of desperation. Punch drunk and pride stung, I spin around. Is that all you've got? I scream, he laps gently at my legs, grins and retreats. Out for the count, my knees give way and I find myself slumped in the shallows, spitting out salt and thanking the referee upstairs that I'm alive. No more, you win. Um, <clears throat> the next one is called Talk to Me Always and in short, it is, uh, this is what I would want my family to, to know if for whatever reason I was not here tomorrow. 
Talk to me always. Do not stop conversing with me after I am gone. For the physical body may have left your sight, but I will always be beside you. Do not think that I have departed or withdrawn from you, for I am more with you now than I ever was before. I am traveling with you, above and beyond you. I feel your thoughts and I hear your prayers. I am here. Speak my name and I am here. Call for help and I am here. Ready to celebrate when you are jubilant and close with comforting arms when you are wounded in heart or head. I am here. You know my voice, so do not despair if you do not hear me reply, for your heart hears me as clear as day. I am here. More able and more present, I am with you. Physical laws can no longer confine me, and I transcend all dimensions within you and without you. I am here. Close your eyes. See my face smiling back at you. Rest your head on my shoulder and know that I will be with you always. <clears throat> uh, the next one uh, is, about, is about a very, very intense love affair I had, not necessarily with a person. It's called Two Years Since You Left. Today was the first day that I did not long for you. Two years to the day since you last touched my lips. Ours was an intense love affair and you brought out the best in me. With you, I felt loved and I was able to love in return. Friends at first, we grew to adore one another. Others would see our bond and were warmed by our love. You taught me to dance, to kiss, to make love. You made me fearless and courageous all at once. The perfect pair, the life of the party. But our need for each other outgrew our once naive love. I would start to panic if you were late to a dinner and people would notice the other side of me before you arrived. I was split in two, one half with you always shining, the other half without you, morose, insecure and dark. The moment you arrived, my mood would switch from sullen to joyful with an eerie air of desperation. Once happy, all was forgiven. We danced, joked and fated until one day something changed in me and it all came to a shuddering halt. I craved independence from your siren's call, wanting instead to practice self-love rather than the dance of fatal attraction. Our divorce was so sudden, so harsh, that I was unable to go out lest I should run into you and fall back into your seductive arms. In the company of others, your absence was akin to a lack of oxygen. Making my excuses, I would return to the safety of my hermit existence. But time passed, and in place of you, I channeled my love into creativity and the love of others. I found peace, peace in stillness and rode the high of creative waves and clarity of vision. And so here I sit, surrounded by people who can love you in moderation. And I am two years happy and I am two years sober. Uh, <clears throat> the next one, uh, this penultimate one, is a response to uh, these times, not just 2020, but the last decade or even longer. I mean, it's um, when you're faced with burning rainforests and corrupt rulers and human inequality and everything. And you just feel like you want to do good and you want to try and do stuff, but you feel this, the mountain is too huge. Um, and so I will not read this. We have a video of somebody who's going to read this. Thursday's child. Defeated and slouched over my legs, I sit. Dark clouds atop my fallen head tinged black with the ash of scorched rainforests and corrupt rulers. Try as I might to see any hope, the enormity of our demise looms, and I watch in despair as my children, my descendants, innocently play. Daily we try to stem the tsunami of our polluted and poisoned neglect, yet we are outweighed and outgunned by the armies of avarice and greed. 
those armies who were blind to their own downfall, not realizing that with each gluttonous act, they pull our world closer to the precipice. I see those around me, struck dumb by these unbeatable foes, unable to lift their sword, unable to see any sign of a war being won. Thursday's child then whispers to me. He tells me that it is not our war to win. We fight these bloodied skirmishes that our descendants may one day taste victory. So let not frustration dull your blade. For each small stone we lay will be the foundation from which generations yet unborn will rise high over evil. The king in his kingdom knew that he would not see the promised land, yet his reign allowed his followers to reach it in his stead. So raise your head once more, lead, fight, and inspire. For the battle of our survival is at hand, and we cannot and we must not fail. One last one, which is a little, little lighter. Um, <clears throat> and it is um, about the wonderful battle um, between my complete lack of patience and my wife's sometimes tardiness. And it's called She Is Late. And uh, it was written from a memory from one of our first three dates. She is late. She is late again. She was supposed to be here at eight. And in anticipation, I have been ready since seven, hovering around my front door since 7.55. Half an hour has passed since she was supposed to knock on that door. Every minute past eight is more uncomfortable than the last and my heart hovers somewhere between anger and despair. 45 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes. I feel wounded and want to lash out by leaving. A text arrives and I fumble my phone from my pocket. Can't find a taxi anywhere, she says. Can't find a taxi, can't find a taxi. Why is she just now looking for a taxi? Furious, I grab my jacket and head out the door. But before it slams behind me, my foot reaches back to block it. My pride pushes me to exit this painful scene, but my newfound love for this girl holds me back. I want to retreat, drown my petulance and ignore her calls. I want to teach her a lesson, but I am left completely undone. Despite the pain this waiting inflicts on me, I would rather wait for days than not see her at all. Being late is beauty's privilege, someone once said. I hate that someone. I hate the fact that she has this power over me. Yet I know that every second, every second spent with her feels different from any spent before she came into my life. Take your time, I mutter under my breath. I will brood when you arrive, but inside I will be smiling, knowing that I will wait for you always. And that's it. <laughs> So who was that woman reading that poem? That, 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 that was lovely, lovely, very generous Miss Julia Roberts reading that. And you've shot her many times, am I, am I wrong? Uh, no, no, I've, yes, I've shot her very, uh, over the years, definitely a few times, yeah. She's a wonderful subject to shoot. I love it. Well, she's gorgeous, She looks, and she's a good reader of poetry, and you're an amazing reader. <laughs> you are a natural public speaker. She, <laughs> She if this photography thing doesn't work out, you really need to pursue this poetry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah. Sabia, are we supposed to do questions now, or should I keep talking? We can do questions. So, why don't we our do question? first question is going to be from Heather, who asks, what made you decide to add poetry to this book, allowing people into a vulnerable part of your mind? Mm. The first word that comes to my brain is stupidity. <laughs> um, well, uh, because you know, it's it's funny going back to the, my stepfather when, when during speaking to him in his last few weeks defined everything, every decision I have ever made since then, and <clears throat> every decision I make is about, without wanting to sound too morbid, is about how would I want to, how would I feel about this decision on my deathbed, and. 
so all of these things that I wanted to try or wanted to do, you know, poetry, when I write poetry, I, it, it makes me feel amazing. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm in the flow of this creative flow and I wanted to sort of share that with people. And if I can share that with people and make money for a charity, then all the better. But even when I wrote my first book, I thought, what the hell am I doing? I'm a fashion photographer. You can't jump out of your lane. You know, people are going to think you're an idiot, but on my deathbed, I'm not going to give a shit <laughs> on my deathbed. I'm going to think, you know what, if, if poetry made me happy and it was about spreading a little bit of light and love and compassion and raising some money, then who gives a crap? I love it. You know, that I think the magic really starts in your life when you don't give a shit, when you start to not give a shit about what people think. That really is a big change. But just in the talk to me always poem, I'm wondering if what you said, it was, I totally 100% believe it. You will always be there for, for your loved ones. Was the experience you had with your stepfather, did that inspire those feelings or did you always feel that way? No, definitely. The, uh, that was, I think that was written, half written probably in the hours after he passed away. I mean, his passing and the years afterwards, I wrote, I really, you realize when somebody's gone, how important they were to you. And I knew he was an amazing father, but you just don't realize how important he was. And I've written so many poems about him and about what he taught me and about just the blessing that he was. And so, um, yeah, I, I kind of, I, I talk to him all the time. So that's what I, I think that that poem is kind of like what he is saying to me and what I would want to tell my family. I love it. You know, there was a beautiful answer. No, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and our uh, next audience question is from Echo Shaker, who asks, and this question is directed at both you and Mickey. So we'll actually start off with Mickey and then transition to you, Alexi. It's what's your favorite poem? both in general and in this collection? Though if you prefer to answer either one, you are welcome to. Wow. Well, <laughs> of course I love them all. And I love that um, talk to me always. Um, but I was saying to Alexi before reading that, I can't remember the part of purpose, There, there's a section of the purpose poem that I really love, which is I decide to be rich, richer than I could ever dream of. Yet this will not be measured in coin, mortar, or land. It will be counted in the lives that I touch, the animals, and the environment I protect. And that's sort of similarly to what Alexi just said about how he feels about death. I mean, that to me is how I feel about life is because you think, you know, I sometimes think about, um, not that this is about me, this is about Alexi. But, you know, I, I, as I get older, I sometimes stop and think, okay, now what are the most amazing parts of my life? Like if my life flashes before me, my eyes, like if I was going to die now, what would I remember and what would be important to me? And it's not great moments of my career. It's not, it's driving around in a little rent-a-car in any place in Europe, like with friends or loved ones, kind of just driving around Sicily or driving through Romania. You know what I mean? It's not even necessarily one specific spot. It's just a being on an adventure of exploring the world, being open to what's going to, we're going to see and discover. And, I love that approach to life in general and that in purpose, I think captured it beautifully. So that's, um, otherwise I'm not a big poetry reader. I know you're shocked. <laughs> shocked. I do know, I could, just the only poem I know by heart is, um, Oh Rose Thou Art Sick by William Blake. For some reason I stuck, I had an amazing poetry teacher in college who was a total freak and for some reason he loved that poem. So I have that poem memorized. But. Amazing. That's nice. That's good work <laughs> Um, for me, my favorite poem in the book is probably, um, I mean, I would, I, 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 I'm so attached to all of them because but I, I know that um, <laughs> the, 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 the person who's asking the question will think I'm being biased, but um, I do love this, the poems about my wife because it's simply just like, when you, when, I'd say my wife and my kids, the poems about my wife and my kids are just, because they come from literally nowhere. And it's just like, you realize what a blessing you have. And it just it doesn't have to be this momentous occasion that it's like, oh, I'm gonna write this poem about this amazing moment. It can be just this, a look. Suddenly they glance over you. I wrote a poem once for my wife. I don't think it's in this book. And it was, I, I was coming back from flying somewhere and there was, I'd finished all my work. So I thought I'm just gonna relax and watch a really crappy rom-com movie. 
And it was it was some movie, I can't remember the, remember the name, but it was a typical story. Boy meets girl in New York City. They live happily ever after, right? And so I wrote this poem called uh, 10 Years After the Credits Roll. And it was about what happens to this couple 10 years after the credits roll. You see them walking down the street, they're hip young New Yorkers. And I love that one because it was about, it's about this is what I have now with my wife is what happens 10 years after the credits roll. And I talk about the fact, it made me think about it just because I would see her in the kitchen wearing this blue T-shirt. I love her wearing blue. And um, I would see her wearing this blue T-shirt and I see the kids running around and I'm like, oh shit, this is, this is what happens 10 years after the credits roll. We're still together. She's still amazing and I'm still inspired and that's it. So anything to do with kids and family. Our next question is from Erica who asks, you've mentioned in the talk pulling inspiration from your family and movies. I'm curious to know what's the oddest place you found inspiration? Ooh, good question. Mm. There's definitely been some odd ones. I don't know. I don't, I, I'm sure there's definitely a, a weird one, um, but I can't think of it right now. But there's there's a lot comes from movies. You know, when my wife and I go on a date night, which is when you have two kids, those are precious, precious moments. And we will sort of go and have dinner, we're going to see a movie. And me and my wife are such criers. <laughs> which sounds pathetic. We'll go to a movie, and as we come out of the movie, we'll go and sit down. I'll go to the bathroom to ball. <laughs> to cry that. And for example, there was one movie. Um, I mean, obviously, this is the, this is a com complete obvious one, but the uh, A Star Is Born. And after that one, I wrote a, a poem immediately called uh, "Even Love Songs Die," or "Even Love Songs." I mean, yeah, "Even Love Songs Die." love songs die because I was writing about like how you know why why do we why do we create why do any why, why do we paint why do we write poetry why do we write books is because we want to share this this magic that we feel but whether you like it or not these things will fade and die and they'll just be blown from existence um and so it's about that because obviously that song at the end of the movie just makes it's crushing I mean the whole movie is crushing and so I remember just going to the bathroom and crying and immediately writing, writing notes and saying, it's such a shame that there was so much emotion. I'm sure that touched so many people, but in 10, 15, 20, 25 years, that love, that song will be blown in the wind and nobody will know about it anymore. So there's, there's stuff like that. There was also um, the Elton John movie. What was that called? Starman or something? No, what was it called? The Elton John movie. Rocketman. And that one, when he hugged his young self, at the end, that broke me because it just made me think of all of the things that when you're growing up, worries you had, insecurities you have, traumas you had, and being able to sort of tell your younger self, you know what, it's gonna be okay. And uh, that, that, oof, start crying now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost crying, I'm almost crying. You make you people cry. <laughs> Good. <laughs> we used to have a, we used a competition at home. Um, my my siblings and I, who could make my mum cry for a happy cry, because she's Peruvian, so she cried at anything. I mean, she was the one who taught me how to cry in front of movies. I remember the oh. first one she taught me to was Dead Poet Society, and I was like, I am not going to cry at this. And then <laughs> by the end, I'd just be like. <laughs> I cry at every movie. movie. I don't know. Which one? Any movie on a plane, I cry. I remember once I watched um, What Lies Beneath with um, Michelle Pfeiffer, and it's a horror movie, and I cried in that. I don't know why. <laughs> it, was it was on Lufthansa. And then afterwards, they had a special news thing about what was going on, and they showed the Special Olympics, and Arnold Schwarzenegger made a speech at the Special Olympics, and that made me cry. And then like, I watched another movie, and that... I cry. There's something about the air up there that just makes me cry about everything. Yeah, so I, think cry. I love crying. I listen to that star song from Star Is Born and cry regularly, and I'm, I get excited about crying to that song. Yeah, and it's crazy because that song, I can listen to it, and I'm immediately inspired again. I just want to write and write and write. 
I've heard it a thousand times, and I know it's going to make me cry, and I, I know yeah. I'm going to some stuff after it. I mean, what what a power! What a what an amazing creative gift! Bradley Cooper and and Lady Gaga. What a, what insane! Amazing. Who would have thought? Bradley Cooper. Who would have thought? I mean, he that that movie is amazing. He did an incredible job. Yeah, and she's incredible. She's one of the most inspiring people I've ever worked with. I don't know if you've shot her, but I mean, she's just like so. You need to. She's so inspiring and so in it. She just is so committed to it, and she's just so real, which is funny to say because she dresses like a freak. But um, she's uh, yeah, she's very inspiring. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. So before we close out, let's see. Erica asks: Was there a poem which, after writing it, you were surprised by? Which I think she means, did it end up somewhere unexpected for you? Um, usually the poems come out really quickly. It's, I'm not somebody who can labor over it and sort of, um, you know, sort of um, come back to it, keep coming back to it. I have to write it in one sitting. And so it's not like the sort of, uh, it's not the sort of um, thing where I'll write a bit and I'll come back to it a few weeks later and then I'll, I'll go off in this direction or this direction. It comes down in, hard and fast and it comes through my pen and I have to write it down. So it's, I'm just kind of enjoying the ride. And I think that when you're a creative person, it's such a blessing. If anybody's watching and you're a creative person, it is such a gift to be, to be able to tap into the creative ether or whatever you want to call it, the creative energy that surrounds us. And to be able to allow that to come through your pen or your paintbrush or hammer and chisel or whatever you're doing. Um, and I've been so lucky with my with my photography career. Um, and so being able to, I just feel like this is a absolutely unnecessary, but very much appreciated extra gift that I've been allowed to experience. And so that's why I'm a firm, I'm a firm believer in sort of keeping the flow going. And that's why all the money goes to charity because simply because, you know, you've got to sort of, I feel like it's, I don't feel like it's me writing the writing it down. I feel like it's literally because I know that if I force myself to write, nothing nothing great comes out. And so when this stuff comes through me, I know it's nothing to do with me. It's just basically just whoever it is up there goes bloop, and then it just sort of drops in. But I will say, meditation has helped so much because in these times, you know, we are we are on this thing all the time. Like you can't even go to the shower without sort of flicking through Instagram. And I realized that you, we are, we inundate ourselves with imagery and therefore emotions. Like you go, you go past um, your images on Instagram and every image you go past gives you a micro emotion, whether it's jealousy or pleasure or laughter or pain or sadness, but you don't stop and go, I'm going to process that emotion. You immediately flick on to the next one, happy, sad, angry. And so you build up this, this surplus mountain of emotions that you have to process. And we never do, we never allow ourselves time. And we, we're constantly looking at laptops, iPhones, et cetera, et cetera. So being able to stop and meditate and allow stuff to go through is amazing because in all those emotions I feel, whether it's because of social media, whether it's because walking down the street and seeing something, you give yourself time to process it and, and, and allow it to just melt out of your head. Sometimes it will stick to poetry and sometimes it'll just get washed out because you need to wash it out. And um, so, yeah, I have no idea what the question was, but we went off somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I think it ended up in a very interesting place, uh, particularly as we just got in a flood more of questions. So I may just slip in one more following that up, which asks, do you think you can learn to be creative? Have you experienced barriers to creativity? And this one is to both you and Mickey. And why don't we start off with Mickey and then we'll give you the last one. And you said, have, have, have you experienced what? what? Have you experienced barriers to creativity? Oh, right. right. So barriers to creativity? Um, I was just talking today, I had lunch with um, a, one of my favorite writers who's worked with me at paper for years and writes for the New York Times and many other places. And one of my barriers, horribly, I have to say is, um, it's hard for me if I'm not on a crazy deadline, if there's not, if I don't, you know, if I, 
don't feel like it's immediate, like I need to do it immediately. And I think it's amazing to hear, Lexi, that you sit down and write um, your poems in one sitting, because I feel like that, in a way, is sort of the best way to do things on some level. But for me, you know, if I, know I have weeks and weeks until something's due, I, I feel like I can't even really do it until it's like the day before or the night before or the day after even. So that for me is a challenge. But um, but I think that, you know, you can overcome it. You just have to kind of dig in, depending on what it is, absolutely, you know, as well. Because like with Alexi too, like when you have to do a shoot some a cover, the day is picked for you. So whether you're busy before or you, you know, have enough time to really get it together. You have to make it happen and you have to come up with some good ideas. So you kind of can force yourself. Writing is a little bit different, I feel like, but um, I'm going to try some meditation from what Alexi said, so. Really? <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think that in terms of um, creative, it's, it's, creativity is a fascinating thing because I think that sometimes boundaries help you. Sometimes I find like if I have to do a, um, Let's talk about photography. If I'm doing a, a, a shoot for a magazine or something, and if it's a celebrity, and you're supposed to have eight hours, and you're supposed to do a cover in 10 pages, and if the celebrity suddenly is four hours late is and says she or he wants to leave an hour early because she's got something to do, so then everybody on the set is freaking out because you've got three hours to do everything. And I'm the only one smiling because I know that that means there's no time for second guessing yourself. And you shut off one side of your brain and the other side takes over. The, whatever, which, I don't know, is your left or right side, which is just about instinct and just going with the flow and you know, without over, over analyzing everything. And for me, that's, where, that's sometimes when I get my best work is when I'm literally forced into the tightest position with zero time and you just gotta just go on autopilot and think what works, what's gonna work, not, not overthink it. Um, but in terms of writing, uh, the barriers for me is when I force myself to write. When I think, what will I write about today? Love, the ocean, <laughs> and nothing comes out. It's like Sahara Desert, nothing, 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 dryness. And like I said, the only poem I force myself to write is called um, My Ink Runs Dry. <laughs> and it's about, it's about sort of this, um, the pages, it's actually in the book, and it's about the pages of the book looking at me like a dissatisfied lover, and sort of with my pen going limp as it goes. To the, <laughs> and um, so it's, uh, yeah, if I, if I force myself, that's my, that's my barrier. I have to allow it to happen. And actually, I have to allow a lot of things to happen in my life organically. We should say that Julia Roberts is not the celebrity who was four hours late, by the way. What was that? We should say that Julia Roberts is not the celebrity who was four hours late. Never late, never. <laughs> both for such a incredible conversation. Mickey, you're a wonderful interviewer. Alexi, your answers were just fascinating and interesting. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, for everyone who's attending, if you haven't yet purchased a book, I've dropped an order link in the chat. So feel free to do it. Alexi will be signing them all personally. So it won't be a book plate. You'll get a real signature. And on that note, thank you everyone and have a very good night. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.